This is Ed Rep Radio, presented by Eastman Music Company. This is Ed Rep Radio, a podcast to bring you ideas and information from industry experts you can use on the road every day. Presented by Eastman Music Company, and I'm your host, Shane Duell. I'm sure you've noticed that working with your school orchestra teachers requires a somewhat different approach compared to working with band teachers. Most Ed Reps on the road today come from a band background, and you might feel it's challenging to connect at the same level with your orchestra teachers as you do with band directors. Our guest today is John Rahani, manager of Encore Orchestral Strings at Pages Music in Indianapolis. John gave a great presentation at NASMD in Tucson on the topic of working with string players and string teachers, so we invited him on to EdRep Radio to share his wisdom with you. You will learn so much from John in this episode on how string players and teachers view instruments in their profession, what you can do as an EdRep to build stronger relationships with this group of teachers, how to compete with the mystique of the string shop in your area, and so much more. John Rahani, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Shane. So this is a topic that I know is always very interesting to ed reps because most ed reps are not string players and find the string world just a little different than band. And before we launch into this this topic, I'd like to get to know your background and and how you got to be there at Pages Music in your role. Yeah, let me see if I can dive in and keep it short. I'd say my path was non-traditional, but I'm not sure anyone follows a traditional Hmm. path anymore. For education, I was at Butler University here in Indianapolis for cello performance in the late 90s and graduated with my cello performance degree from Butler. Hmm. But I'd also met a girl oh. that uh, became my wife, and she's an Indiana girl. And we had decided to stay put and uh, try to live the American dream, you know, white picket fence, two and a half kids. Mm-hmm. And so I had ventured out after my undergraduate into the business world. I actually, my first job was with Baldwin Piano huh. as a factory representative. And that job was back, you know, in the pre-internet days when I was literally looking in the Indie Star Classifieds for a job and Hmm. saw the word piano and said, hey, that involves music. Let me go take a look at that. And I learned a lot in that job. I wasn't there particularly long, but uh, learned a lot about being a good employee and got to know the music business a little bit. And then went from there, actually, to another deep passion of mine, which is diesel engines, of all things. Yeah, and I ended up at Cummins Diesel down in Columbus, Indiana, as a um, materials planner, which is a fancy term for purchaser. So I spent some time there learning purchasing and enjoying that time. And that led me, actually, to another non-musical job in Indianapolis with a small aerospace company called Aerofab where I was also a materials planner and production scheduler for five years. And it was there that I decided I needed to go back and get my master's degree, that if I was going to remain out in the business world, that I needed some additional credentials. And so I went to the IU Kelly School of Business and earned my MBA over three Hmm. years during that time. And that's actually what coincided me graduating with me coming over to Pages Music. Okay. Uh, And I've been here for the last 16 years. Okay. I'm curious, during your um, time in the non-music world, did you continue to play cello? I did. I did. I was still actively performing. Perhaps not. I was busy, uh, so it wasn't as often as I'd Mm. liked, but I I did continue to play and uh, maintain some of those hard-earned chops from the the college days. Yeah, yeah, good. Good. And in your role now at Pages, are you still an active active player, performer? I am. Yeah. I, I just, I love the cello. Mm. I really do have a deep passion for it and deep passion for the music written for the instrument and, uh, you know, perform with local orchestras and some chamber music and play at my church occasionally and just try to stay involved in all the ways that I can. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And your role there now at Pages Music? I manage Encore Orchestral Strings, which is the the violin shop division of Pages Music, handling 
the better than student level string instruments that we offer. Okay. okay. For the serious players, the ones coming off of their beginner instruments, right? You work with those students. Primarily, but I do love and cherish the relationships I have with, you know, all the local orchestra directors mm. and private teachers. Mm. So I cross over into those beginning students as well in my okay. role. Yeah, good. Good. That that will serve us well in this conversation. I really am fascinated by this topic of of string players because being an ed rep, and I think most ed reps listening right now would say, when you walk into a band room, there is a certain feel to the the room, to, there's an energy to it. There is a certain, I guess, type that you find in the band room, both band director and student. And then you walk into an orchestra room and it changes. There's a different energy. There's a different vibe. The students and the teachers are not not the same as a band teacher. And, and same if you walked into a choir room. It seems like, and I'm completely stereotyping here, I, I, I realize this, but there's there's kind of a generalization of band, orchestra, and, and choir when it comes to the personalities of the students and the teachers. And one thing I'd like to start this conversation with is string players and kind of what makes them up? What makes them tick? Why would they be different in any way than a band student? And again, we're generalizing here, but hopefully there'd be some some interesting, useful information that we can learn about what makes them different. What do you think, John? Yeah, Shane, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in the fact that we definitely are going to have to paint with a pretty broad brush here in order to, to draw any useful differences. Because on one hand, it's easy to say a music student is a music student, whether it's band, orchestra, and choir. You know, they're drawn to, to that the way someone else might be drawn to something else. But the truth is that, you know, the term orc dork, yeah. for instance, is, you know, one that is fallen out of favor with a lot of people. But, you know, most of us, most every orchestra student that I know of sort of embraces that term. Huh. And so you wonder why, like, why would someone actually wear something like Orc Dork with a um, air of pride that that they're part of that group? And, you know, as I was trying to, to generalize again about the, the differences, I had the thought that, you know, this is going to date me a little bit as well. But while both an orchestra student and a band student might have liked Harry Potter, hmm. The, the orchestra student is the one that actually had their own cape and <laughs> wand and, you know, had the banner of their house, you know, up in their room. So it is almost like a degree of nerdiness. I love it. That, that can that can differentiate it. And so, you know, I see I see the one word that keeps coming to mind is, is tradition. Mm. And I think that that orchestra room from the instruments that are played, you know, that were perfected 300 years ago to a lot of the repertoire that's played, written hundreds of years ago. There's just generations and generations and generations of string students and string performers that came before mm. that sort of informs that sense of connectedness that the orchestra, the typical orchestra student has with their instrument mm. and their ensemble. Mm. And the literature, it sounds like. Yes, correct. Mm. That's interesting. You know, it's a good point. I mean, trumpet valves weren't even invented until the 1850s and by then, the like the Strad instruments are already over 150 years old. That's that's interesting. Yeah, Strad's long long dead. Yeah, right. it's incredible. Right. So, how do you think that tradition of the instruments and the literature changes the mindset of an orchestra student versus a band student? What is it about that tradition? That's a good question to ask, and I'm I'm sitting here trying to think about how that informs how they interact with their peers and their orchestra director. I do feel that. Even the orchestra room compared to the band room, even the orchestra performance compared to a marching band performance or, or, you know, even if it's a concert band, the whole act of playing in an orchestra is something that's been done and it feels familiar over time. Mm. And so I do feel like both the teachers and the directors and the private teachers and the students feel tied to that tradition hmm. in a way that might be different in a subtle way, but meaningful way than the band tradition. Okay. Is it a sense of honoring this long tradition with the orchestra world? I do. I think there's honoring, there's respecting, and there's also, you know, carrying on. And there's that sense of connection where if, if they're playing even a transcription of a Beethoven symphony, you know, it's a melody that's been played for, you know, 150 mm. years. It's, 
it's it's something that they can go home and they can listen to a recording of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, play that very same melody. Hmm. And so there's that continuity. And I can't, you know, it's hard to put your finger exactly on how that informs and impacts their experience in the classroom, but I think it's it's palpable. It is there. And so it's just something to be aware of as you're as you're treading in those waters. Yeah. yeah. You know, you you mentioned something that I find interesting as well. In the orchestra world, you have professional organizations that you can look up to with these major symphonies around the world. You know, like in the US, the Chicago, Philadelphia, LA, New York, you have these these great, great orchestras that have quite a following live in their orchestra halls. They have this huge library of recordings they've done. But that doesn't really exist for band. You don't have major bands like they did maybe a hundred years ago. Do you think that having these major symphony orchestras in some way changes the way that orchestra students and teachers kind of view their art? Absolutely. And I think it has, there's definitely a halo effect that that happens with these professional symphony orchestras, but also the fact that these orchestras, especially in, in 2022, are very accessible to those students and are actually yearning for a connection hmm. and actively working towards a connection. So whereas when I was growing up, you know, the principal cellist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra seemed like a god, hmm. you know, some someone that was not only unattainable to reach that kind of skill, but also I would never be able to have just a conversation with that person or I'd never be able to actually talk to them about their art and how they learned and, and learn lessons from them in that fashion. And now those very same organizations are, are doing everything they can in terms of outreach hmm. to connect with those school age children here in Indianapolis, you know, the, the education arm of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, there's an open invitation, you know, to local school programs to, to come to a concert or interact with the musicians and they're sending the musicians out into the schools. And so, there is that halo effect, and yet there's also that sense of connectedness that's being fostered. And I think that's going to be a, a very powerful way to be able to continue that tradition. Mm, mm, that's great. Yeah. You know, I was also thinking, it seems like band students don't necessarily think about orchestras, and even though there are obviously trumpets, trombones, the woodwinds, the percussion in orchestras. It seems like band students don't think about orchestras as a potential career like string players do. And even most high schools don't have a full orchestra ensemble that meets during the day, at least, where they have the winds and the strings together. Do you find that as a string player, you feel kind of a, a draw to potentially becoming a player in an orchestra from the get-go? I think there's often a progression of dreams, you know, when it comes to being a string player. And I think often the, the very first step, you know, for a serious string student is the desire i want to be in a section of a major symphony orchestra hmm. i know that was definitely my dream going into butler was you know four years at butler take auditions you know miraculously end up in the, the chicago symphony <laughs> orchestra and live happily ever after right, right. and you know when, once you've obviously talked to a lot of these professional orchestral musicians and you understand that it's a very challenging profession and let alone the audition process and all those things mm. then perhaps those dreams as a student evolve but i think in a very formative way that is step number one you know in terms of of what i might want to accomplish as a string player mm. Mm, okay. Is part of this becoming a, a great string player, uh, is part of this why s some students start so young at the age of three and four and five? I think so. And I do think that there that is uniquely string, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you never see a three-year-old trumpet no, player. No, they can barely hold it. Um, exactly. But I do. I have several friends with with young, you know, young children that have already started them on string instruments. And there is a sense of you know, giving them an advantage. Hmm. And yet a friend of mine who was a, a roommate of mine back at the Aspen Music Festival is currently the concert master of the New York Philharmonic. And he did not start at age three. Hmm. So I do think that that's perhaps it can be a great experience for some students, but the pressure to feel like you're already behind the, the eight ball if you don't start until you're eight. I mean, I hmm. don't think that there's necessarily a lot of correlation okay. there. I'm curious of your peers and, and at Butler, for example, how many of them started really young versus started in the school orchestra? Yeah, only a handful started really, really okay. young. Some started, you know, just prior to school orchestra, but 
myself included. I mean, I didn't start taking private cello lessons until I was a sophomore in high school. Hmm. So, okay. uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, my story is slightly non-traditional in that, in that way as well. And I think depending on your interest level, um, and depending on your background, both can be advantages. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to go back to something that we talked about for a moment, the, the tradition of the physical instruments themselves being perfected, as you said, 300 years ago. How do how do orchestra students look at their instruments? You know, it seems like when they first start out as a general school orchestra student, they don't know much about the instruments. But as they learn, what starts to become important to them over the years about instruments themselves? You mentioned that beginning student, Shane, and I think it's fascinating because obviously I, I have the honor and privilege of putting that instrument in some of those students' hands the very first time they've ever held that instrument. Mm. And some students pick it up and look at it um, like the treasure that it yeah. is. You know, they're, they're fascinated by the shape and the, the components, and they're curious about every single aspect of it. And uh, other people pick it up like it's a pair of dirty underwear. Yeah. You know, I just... <laughs> You know, like I, I, it, it never ceases to amaze me that people's reactions to that can be so different. And then as they progress, I definitely think all students begin to understand the implications that their instrument has, hmm. whether they're, you know, enamored or fascinated by it or not. They understand that it is the, you know, the physical vehicle for for making this sound and participating in this ensemble. Hmm. And so they begin to pay more attention to it. And then as that progresses, you definitely have students like myself who were always as fascinated by the equipment itself as I was by the music and the hmm. performing. And then there's another class of student that turns into a, a class of professionals who, uh, you know, the instrument is just this vehicle and there's very little emotional attachment. Hmm. I cannot believe how, you know, covered in rosin and, and dirt and sort of... <laughs> I you know, some of these professionals instruments are, and I am aghast because I'm so fastidious with my, my instrument and my bow, but to them it's, you know, as long as it's working, it's almost binary, you know, it's either on or off, like it's working or it's not. Mm. And that's the extent to which that they, they care about that physical instrument. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I want to continue with this conversation on, on the string player and, and how, how they think and what's important to them moving from the student to the teacher's that are teaching these students in, in orchestras and middle schools and high schools in particular, you know, people that ed reps work with every day. How would you describe the general approach and personality to, again, we're generalizing, uh, to, to middle school and high school orchestra teachers and, and how, how might they think differently than band teachers? Yeah. Again, so many of these people are my, my close friends. And so I've gotten to know them very well, hmm. both in and out of the classroom and words do come to mind. I mean, if we're painting with the broad brush and we're speaking positively for a moment, you know, passionate, committed, idealistic, creative, caring, empathetic, hmm. all of these things, driven, encouraging, all these things are, are right at the top of mind. But we do need to be aware that they can also feel isolated and insecure and frustrated and doubtful. Hmm. You know, they're humans. And these middle school and high school directors, especially the middle school level, are almost exclusively teaching in a classroom by themselves. Mm. Whereas so many band programs are team teaching oriented where you've got multiple teachers in the classroom. Yeah, right. So, you know, that informs a lot of, you know, who they are, how they make decisions, how they run their programs, how they manage their classrooms. You know, there's a lot of benefits to being the captain of the ship and not having to interact or collaborate with anyone. But it can also lead to like that feel, like I said, the feeling of isolation and, you know, a desire for more community. Hmm. Yeah. How do they get that community if, they, if they're alone so much? Uh, or the, the only adult in the room, how do they get, get that community? Well, honestly, Shane, that's, I mean, part of one of the things that I feel like is a part of my role to facilitate such huh. things. So, you know, even as a company, Pages has had, um, you know, hosts a golf outing or hmm. a picnic or, you know, some kind of social environment in which we can pull these teachers together. Because especially, I mean, time is their most precious commodity. Hmm. And it's so much easier to come home exhausted at the end of a school day 
and collapse on the couch and binge watch your favorite show and, you know, mm-hmm. do those things versus, you know, then turning around and needing to go back out and interact with, with other human right. beings. So yeah, creating those opportunities, making those connections, the professional organizations in our area, like we have a very strong state ASTA chapter, the American String Teachers Association. And so having events through those avenues as well, bring those people together. Mm. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I like the golfing outing idea. That sounds like a great way to get people together and just kind of a, a not really work environment, just kind of outside and, and bonding, right? Well, the funny thing about the golf outing, as soon as I said it, Shane, was that we routinely have a really hard time getting orchestra directors to go golf. Interesting. For whatever reason. Do they not golf? So I, yeah, no, at least in our area, there are very few golfing orchestra directors. Huh. So I'll, one memorable year, I just decided, you know, I'm going to be going to this golf outing. None of these people want to play golf. And so I just set up a wine and cheese picnic at the ninth hole and just invited all the orchestra directors to, to <laughs> sit and, you know, just enjoy each other's company and watch people play golf. And that actually was fairly successful. So sometimes you have to be creative. Okay. So uh, maybe wine and cheese over uh, a sports outing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So you mentioned that that sense of isolation that a lot of orchestra teachers have as being a, a particular challenge unique to them. What else comes to mind that, that orchestra teachers have to deal with that maybe band teachers don't? One thing orchestra teachers have to deal with is obviously their fellow department people. So the, the band directors, the choir directors, and oftentimes because of the way things happen, at least in our area, there aren't as many music department chairs that are the orchestra directors hmm. as there are music department chairs that are the band directors or the choir directors. Okay. And I think part of that's longevity. Um, we could probably get into a whole nother topic there. But as a result, the orchestra director often feels like they have a slightly adversarial relationship with those people in terms of getting the resources they need mm. budget, you know, budget wise, getting the priority they need in terms of recruiting time. Mm. And they feel like there is some competitiveness within the department that, you know, isn't necessarily always helpful. So mm. that's, that's one thing the orchestra directors that, you know, I talk to sometimes feel that they're not, you know, when the school district does invest in the programs that maybe they're not getting their fair share based on numbers. Hmm. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. And then while while the band and choir directors might disagree with me here, I do feel like you have some parent involvement on the orchestra side that can be a little bit overbearing. Interesting. Almost like a yeah. stage parent kind of mindset with those Correct. parents. Correct. Oh. Yeah. I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm treading carefully here because I, I want to make sure I don't overgeneralize, but yes, you know, especially if you've got that student that did start when they were younger with private lessons, maybe they've been playing three years before they start beginning orchestra. Mm. And all of a sudden you've got parent emails about, you know, my, my kid's bored and what are you doing to challenge them and what opportunities can you give them? And mm. I do feel like I hear stories of that maybe more often on the orchestra side than in, in other in other avenues. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if they started when they were three and they're in the seventh grade orchestra, they have way more experience than someone who started in sixth grade. Which I always tell parents is nothing but a positive, right? Mm. You know, that, that student can be a leader in that group. They can be a resource to the teacher, but it really does come down to attitude. The, the student has to have the right attitude in that situation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Going back to something you said about the orchestra teachers feeling like they're just not the priority. And in pardon this terrible pun, but it sounds like they feel like they're always playing second fiddle <laughs> to the it. to the band and the choir. So what are some things an ed rep can do to to help that teacher? It sounds like they have some struggles. And ed reps come in every week. What what can they do to to help this teacher feel better about their jobs and, and their position at the school and things like that? Well, I know our guys here at Pages Music do an incredible job of of just making a personal connection mm. with those directors. And I think that's, I mean, as every good ed rep knows, I mean, that's such a big part of the job. Mm -hmm. um, often feeling more like therapist than, than ed rep, you know, just a listening ear, um, encouragement, and understanding that that time is precious to the director and in giving them that time like a gift, you know, their undivided attention in those moments. And that goes a long way because then the, the director does feel open 
and ready to share what their needs are. Hmm. You know, some directors are very practical in all business and, you know, you're going to come in and they're going to give you the, here are the three repairs and here's the one service ticket and this kid needs a bigger size and thanks for coming. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, another director who on any given day just really needs to talk about what's going on at home or with their kid or, you know, with a colleague. And in those moments, it really is just a matter of, of, of listening and encouraging and trying to forge that personal relationship that then can, can bear the weight of the, the business relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just thinking about what you're saying about them feeling not as important sometimes as the band and the the choir. It seems like an ed rep can really approach the orchestra teacher with that in mind and and make sure that they feel as important, at least to that ed rep as the band teacher and the choir teacher. I've, I've ridden along with ed reps around the country, and sometimes they'll just literally skip the orchestra room. They'll, they'll go see the band teacher and, and skip the orchestra room because maybe they don't feel comfortable speaking string or they just never really engage with the orchestra because they're a band person. Just I had to throw it out there, just making sure that ed reps do visit the orchestra teachers and make them feel extra special. It sounds like that would go a long ways with them. You are so right, Shane, because, you know, they they see if if you're at the the marching band show but not at the orchestra concert or you're at the the football game but not the orchestra concert mm-hmm. or you know any any combination of those things they see that and uh, they feel that so anything that can be done to make them feel like they are at least an an equal partner in all this because the bottom line is an ed rep i mean if you're talking about the band you're doing 150 rental units in the orchestra, you're doing 40, you know, it's easy to, to turn it into dollars and cents mm-hmm. and, and just think of the financial aspect. But if you really do want to grow that relationship and build that program, it, it takes treating them equally and putting them on equal footing. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, f- a feeling that, and I'm speaking from personal experience, most ed reps are, are banned people. They come from a band background. They play a wind instrument or a percussion instrument, or they're percussionists, I should say. And in, in strings are just new to them. They're not as familiar. They they might actually be a little nervous to to talk to string players because they just don't understand them, which is part of the reason we're doing this podcast. So how important is it to orchestra teachers and string players that the person that they're working with from from a store is a string player? I definitely think the answer to that question would vary, you know, from orchestra director Mm. to orchestra director. But I also believe that at least everyone that I work with would encourage and, you know, honor the efforts of someone who wasn't an orchestra director to try to try to walk the walk and talk the talk. Mm. So it's I don't think there's maybe as much genuine snobbishness as might be perceived. Mm. You know, it's the same way that a lot of times, you know, people who tend towards introvertedness can be mislabeled as standoffish hmm, yeah. or you know prickly or wh- however you want to word it when the the genuine case is they just don't feel comfortable around other people hmm. and so it's the same thing with the the orchestra world i think when you're you know dealing with that person as a band person as a you know non-string person just lots of listening mm-hmm. uh, you know lots of questions and lots of listening goes a long way to to better understand them both as a person and as an educator mm-hmm. And then, you know, we've talked about this before, Shane, where just making the effort to learn some of the background information about the string instruments, it's not that difficult. Um, hmm. I mean, there, when you talk about, obviously, huge amounts of tradition, but when you talk about actual features, you know, a violin has less features to memorize than a saxophone. Makes sense. Or, or yeah. So I, I think a little bit of effort goes a long way. Mm, just learning the basics about the names of the parts, what they're made of, the function of them, things like that. Yeah, and a couple names of of historical makers. I mean, you know, if you're if you're walking into an orchestra room and you don't know who Antonio Stradivari is, you should take some time and you know learn a little bit about him and his life and his contribution to violin making and. Mm. You know, 99% of all the instruments that are going to be in the hands of these students are based on just a couple historical makers. And so just knowing a couple names and some history, and that's, that is really all that's required for most string directors to feel like you're making the effort to, to bridge that gap between the two mm. of you. So you don't have to be a string player. You just need to show some effort that, that you're yeah. learning about it and you care about it and you want to learn more. That's been my experience. Yeah, yeah. 
So what are some specific things that ed reps can do for an orchestra teacher to start building that relationship and trust and and just show them that they they can be of really great service to the teachers, even if they don't play a string instrument? Well, we talked about relationship, and I think that's number one. And then making sure that you're always honoring their time. Uh, again, every educator I know, and string, string teachers in particular as well, time is their most precious commodity. So being prepared for the time that you're going to spend together, mm -hmm. being ready to handle their requests and their needs, and to efficiently deal with just the logistical, you know, I'm picking up this repair, I'm dropping off this this instrument for this student and just being professional and prepared for those things. But beyond that, you know, it's empathy and community. Again, just mm. being willing to listen and understand what they're going through as a teacher, as a director, as a human being. As far as I'm concerned, that's 90% of the battle mm. in terms of, of, of being effective in that role. Um, and I realize that's pretty touchy feely. And some people aren't comfortable with that, but you know, it's music. It's the music world. There's a lot of emotions there. You right. know, these are real people and we, we have to treat them that way. And then because we talked about this before, Shane, the helping them build community, you know, they're isolated in their classroom mm. as your ed rep, you're visiting you know, perhaps dozens, perhaps, you know, 50 other schools with, with directors like them. And, you know, suddenly you find out that one of your directors loves classic cars. And then you find out another director of yours loves classic cars. I'm just using a random example, sure. helping those two people who might not know each other because of how isolated they are in this community, making that connection for them, building that community, creating opportunities, you know, a, a cookout on a Sunday afternoon for your directors. I hmm. realize that's a lot of effort sure. to put sure. in, but it, man, the meals I've had at, at my house for, for some of my friends who are in the music world, you know, they still talk about how much fun mm. they had and how they met somebody new. Just those human touches go a long I way. I love it. That's great. That's great. On the flip side, what should an ed rep, especially maybe a band person who's the majority of us out there, what should they avoid doing or avoid saying that will really turn off an orchestra teacher? I know you've heard a couple of them, but things like not calling a violin a horn <laughs> or, you know, not, not calling a fingerboard a fretboard, right. you know, little things like that. And then also just not making stuff up. If hmm. you, most people aren't going to hold, hold it against you if you don't know. But if you just start making stuff up, you know, your credibility is going to go nowhere. So if you don't know the answer, again, smile. I can find that out and go do your research and come back the next week or the next day with a phone call and, and get them the answer that they need. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of, of credibility and, and finding out the in, information about string related things, what are some good sources for, for gaining knowledge and, and building your confidence and background in these strings? I'm going to show my age here by recommending a magazine. Um, <laughs> but but again, it is available online now as well. But when I am training colleagues here in the store about the string world, I usually recommend there's a, a British publication called The Strad Magazine. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the ed rep is going to find particular nuggets of information in there that they're going to automatically be able to use the next week. But it is a great way to immerse yourself in the world of the professional string musician. So just by reading that magazine, learning the terms, they talk about instruments, they talk about concerts, they talk about musicians, and it is a good way to understand what's going on in the classical music world. Mm. And that translates, you know, all the way down to the, to the collegiate level, to then to the high school, to the middle school. So it's all good information. Hmm. That's one. And then the the other that I definitely suggest doing is become an ASTA member, the American String Teachers Association. Become a member, invest that money for an annual membership, and then you'll get their their publications hmm. and then read those publications because they are talk about the exact topics that your orchestra directors are thinking about on a daily basis. Mm, good idea. And again, that's a great way to learn the language and also to invest in the community. Because if you're 
paying your ASTA membership dues, then you are also contributing to that organization, supporting that director that you're trying to build the relationship with. Yeah, great idea. I'll put a link to both the Strad and ASTA in the program notes of this episode so you can quickly find them. What a great glimpse into that world that, that people may not be familiar with. That's a great tip. How about learning from from your luthiers in, in the store, learning about various string instrument things? Is that something you recommend? Absolutely. If, if you're fortunate enough to have, you know, have qualified people, I know that's a real need out in the, uh, the band and orchestra world is to have uh, a qualified string technician, you know, as part of your staff. Um, we're exceedingly fortunate here at Pages to have a, a world-class violin maker on wow. staff as well as several people who I'd consider, you know, incredible repairmen. And there, that is a distinction. I think that even um, the people in those roles would make, you know, the difference between someone who's competent at repairing school level instruments, someone who is competent repairing, you know, high level professional instruments, and then also that person who actually makes the instruments, you know, from start to finish themselves, hmm. different levels, different types of of personalities and skill sets there. So I absolutely take advantage of of Ben here at the store because he's phenomenal. And, uh, you know, he's actually teaching me how to make a cello wow. at the moment. Cool. Yeah. And so that's been a lifelong dream of mine. And that's an extreme example, sure. perhaps, but definitely one that that plays into the question that you asked. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good segue into the various aspects of a music store and what's important to string teachers, because ed reps are out there representing the store. And I'm curious... You know, you have the repair shop, you have the instruments, you have sheet music and accessories and and the road service. What are the most important parts of a music store to a string teacher that that could potentially make or break whether that teacher does business with the store or not? Yeah, at the most basic level, you can think of the instruments that you send out with the students as your business cards. Hmm. So, you know, if those instruments are not meeting the standards of the orchestra director, there's no building a relationship beyond that. You know, let's call that ground level that when when that student shows up in their classroom with a rental or an instrument they purchased from you, that that instrument sounds great, is easy to play, it's well set up, it stays in tune. All of those things are going to create all kinds of positive associations between that that director and your business. Mm. And then again, repairs, the ability for that teacher to send in instruments and receive them back in a timely manner. I still remember a local story here from one of our schools where they were going to do a renovation to the, the orchestra room over the holidays and they did not communicate this to the the director and so the orchestra room was literally vented to the outdoors <sighs> in the middle of december in indiana um which as you can imagine wrecked havoc on their their bass and cello oh, yeah. inventory and so all of a sudden this this teacher is you know in a panic and needing to send in i think it was like 17 bases for repair all at once and needed loaners oh. you know for all those bases as well and so Again, being able to provide that kind of service is something that is unique, I think, to a band and orchestra store versus a traditional violin shop. You know, whereas a traditional violin shop, they, they're not going to want to have to, you know, repair 17 school bases. And they certainly wouldn't have loaners available for that for that period of time. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, uh, the topic of the string shop is something I want to get to in a moment. I want to go back to those instruments, the ones that you said are the business cards. I like that term for, for the music store. What specifically does a orchestra teacher look for in, an, in a, a good instrument? And then what would turn them off if they got a bad instrument? Yeah. On the positive side, again, something that is very well set up that facilitates the student learning the instrument. And by set up, I'm talking about anything from string height to the, the nut grooves, to the tailpiece, to the chin rest, obviously sound post tonal adjustments, but just that all of the components of that string instrument are working in harmony to, to allow the student to learn how to play the instrument. The instruments are hard enough to learn as it is. Mm. I mean, picking up a violin for the first time can be extremely daunting. And if the pegs are slipping or the strings are too high or the bridge isn't shaped properly, it becomes an impossible task. Mm. And that's what the directors are dealing with day in and day out 
when their students are showing up with with the least expensive instruments that are available out there on the on the internet mm. you know and so part of my role is is helping the teachers communicate to the parents that this isn't just an upsell kind of situation this is this is the bare necessities of having an instrument that functions properly and so the flip side of course when you say what turns them off is an instrument that they can't tune won't stay in tune is unplayable or very difficult to play mm -hmm. you know so cheaply made that it's just an impossible proposition for the student mm, yeah now even good quality instruments can have a bad setup right you are a hundred percent correct and that's something that i talk about with parents often too i mean the the interesting thing about the the internet age that we live in is that two instruments can be the same model from the same well-respected workshop and they can play radically differently mm. and they can cost very different amounts of money. You know, if one source wants to compete on price alone, they can put the least expensive accessories on that instrument and still legitimately advertise it as that instrument model. Mm. Whereas then a more conscientious shop is going to take that instrument and they're going to put appropriately, you know, spec components, strings, bridge, tailpiece on that instrument, and they're going to set it up to, to standardized measurements. And then suddenly that instrument is going to play infinitely better, mm. but it's also going to cost a little bit more. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. What comes to mind is in the band world, you can have two, two saxophones that are the exact same model, very good quality. One has really leaky pads and one is perfect. One's going to obviously play much, much better. You know, music stars would, would never send out a saxophone to a, a student with leaky pads, but it sounds like a bad setup on a good instrument is the equivalent of having a, a good, good wind instrument with leaky pads. If you can't play that string instrument because of a bad setup, then it's going to turn that teacher exactly. off. Exactly. And, you know, also again, in the internet age, you can have, you know, even one of our instruments from Pages that is a very well set up instrument. But the last time we saw it was when it went out with a student four years mm. ago. And now all of a sudden it's showing up, you know, on, on a local selling board and a parent grabbed it off their, their neighborhood Facebook page or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they're complaining and they're saying this instrument, you know, doesn't play and it's one of yours and what's wrong. Well, the strings are dead and, you know, the setup's off and it hasn't been maintained over the past four years. So mm. um, there are so many different factors involved in, in you know, presenting an instrument uh, to the student and consequently to the director that then is functioning properly and is that good business card for your, for your yeah. shop. Yeah, it sounds like rental returns need to be taken seriously, right? If it's been out with a student for several years and it comes back, you can't just throw it back into the rental pool? You got it. Yeah, you got it. We, you know, we have staff entirely devoted to going through those things with a fine tooth comb and making sure they're, they're ready for the next student. What kind of things do you see typically on a, let's say an instrument's been out for three years with a student and it comes back, what kind of things do your, your workshop look for and perhaps have to change or, or, or adjust? Yeah, at the bare basics, you know, obviously the strings, we got to make sure the outer windings aren't loose or, or frayed or, you know, the, the strings are still in good, good shape. And if they appear in any way, you know, too old or, or too worn, then they need to be replaced. But one of the things that we see, unfortunately, not only on rental returns, but also on school instruments that are sitting in the classroom mm -hmm. with cellos and basses is that the the directors or the students are allowing the bridges to to warp mm. and to to get pulled because of the tuning action on the strings and obviously replacing a cello bridge or a bass bridge is not inexpensive and so you know when we do hear of a director saying oh i just got the bridge replaced you know six months ago well a bridge can start to warp in six days you know if it's if huh. it's not perpendicular to the top of the instrument and an improper adjustment so that's something that we're always paying attention to along with sound post placement and varnish issues. Of course, some instruments come back with all sorts of embellishments from the students, you know, uh -huh. either scraped or scratched into the varnish. So we've, we've got lots yeah. of stories about those things as well. Yeah, a little, little graffiti as it comes back. Yeah, a little graffiti, <laughs> some, some creative, you know, I'll give them, I'll give them their, their due. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what can an ed rep look for in these instruments, both rental instruments that are going out into the the beginner's hands and school instruments. What can an ed rep look for to spot things that need to be fixed or adjusted or replaced? 
Yeah, simple things, learning, you know, learning about string height and learning about, you know, bridge placement and and the bridge being straight and perpendicular to the top of the instrument. The, these are the kinds of things that really can be eyeballed with just a little bit of training. So as they as they pass through an orchestra room, they can just sweep across the cello rack with their eyes. And a lot of times you can spot these problems as, as they're beginning and, you know, gently make recommendations. Now, whether or not the director has the budget right now to make that repair, that's a whole different conversation, but they can at least be educated and, and understand that as well. Yeah. And then in climates like we have here in, in the Midwest, you know, understanding what an open seam is on a cello or a bass, mm -hmm. you know, where the top or the back has, has come unglued from the sides of the instrument. Something that very commonly happened in the winter here when the facilities turn on the heat and the, the air dries out and the instrument contracts. Mm -hmm. And there are some fairly simple ways to spot that and to, to gauge that and then make those recommendations as well. Yeah. I want to throw out a plug for an earlier episode on Ed Rep Radio. If if the topic of string instrument repairs and what to look for is interesting to you, uh, to those listening, in the first season, Ralph Alcala, who is the head luthier at Eastman in the Pomona, California shop, does a great episode on on all these common repairs and how to look for them. And I think it's very useful to dig into what you're talking about there. Yeah, Ralph's incredible. That would be a great yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So, what are some things that would really turn off? a orchestra teacher to do business with a music store? From the ed rep perspective, you know, I think definitely not honoring that personal relationship, you know, making it all about business, making it all about numbers. Mm. You know, the, the orchestra director in a typical program is already going to feel under pressure to be growing the program, to be recruiting more students. So I think, you know, turning, turning off the orchestra director could be as simple as just overemphasizing the business aspect of the relationship mm. and not prioritizing that personal connection. Mm. In my experience, that that is the number one, you know, killer in terms of of putting that person off. Now, thankfully, Shane, I mean most ed reps, you know, are out there because they are people people. Yeah. They know how to talk to people, they know how to treat people. They they want to develop that relationship. So, that is something that for most of them is going to be easy to sidestep. But I definitely see that as a pitfall that, that some people get into out of an eagerness, you know, to achieve success in that realm, you know, with that relationship. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It goes back to relationships. People do business with people they like. That's it's such, it's come up so many times in so many episodes on this, on this podcast. It's 100% correct. And then, I mean, of course, we talked about the business card of the instruments. You know, if you're if you happen to be putting bad instruments out into the hands of the students or instruments that are not properly adjusted or you're, you know, bungling, you know, repairs or, you know, bungling just the logistical processes of getting instruments to and from the store, from the school, all those things obviously are going to add up mm -hmm. as negatives. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, a, a good relationship can bear a lot of those errors. Not that we want to take advantage of that, but that is the the equity that allows us to make the occasional mistake. Yeah, right. I like that. So something that comes up fairly often in the school music store world, in talking to store owners and salespeople and ed reps, I hear this a lot, that they have a hard time competing with the string shop, with that, with that mystique of the string shop. Uh, they're, they're a music store that does it all, you know, band instruments, string instruments, sometimes pianos, guitars, drums. What is it about the string shop that, that orchestra teachers are attracted to and how do you compete as a school music dealer like a Pages? Well, it goes back to that magic word tradition. You know, so many of us, when you think about classical music world, you think about the the soloist up on the the stage in the beautiful hall that's, you know, with the backdrop of the symphony orchestra, and they're playing a, a famous old concerto on a famous old instrument. Mm. And all of that uh, allure and mystique is is built into the DNA of most people in the string world. And so the the traditional violin shop, especially the traditional violin shop that caters to those fine old Italian and French instruments, it's like going into a fine jewelry store. Mm. You know, everything about it from, you know, it's appointment only and it's it's located in this beautiful historic part of this large city and you take a 
an antique elevator with an elevator operator, you know, <laughs> up to the the fifth floor, and then you walk into the Persian rugs and the the polished mahogany furniture, and uh, literally every aspect of it is just almost overwhelming in the way that it communicates the history and the tradition and the and the money involved in these things mm. you know people people spending hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars on instruments and tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on bows mm. so you know that being in that kind of shop you know is an experience that almost every string player loves to have you know they they want to have the genuine strat in their hands or they you know they want to have the opportunity to to feel connected to these, you know, old master makers. And so that's where the role of that violin shop comes in. And then even the local violin shop that might not cater to that level of, of instrument typically is owned and run by a maker hmm. or a, an accomplished repair person. And so that person has just baked in credibility, you know, that, listen, I make these instruments and I, I, I work on these old old Italian instruments. And there's a, a mystique and a, an allure to all of that that is very intoxicating to your typical string player. I could see that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that at its base, you know, that's it. And I know when I started at Pages 16 years ago, that was very much why I was hired in the sense that Pages was, you know, very established renting string instruments in central Indiana. But the consensus among the local private teachers and the professors was, yeah, that's great. Rent your instrument from Pages. And then when you're ready for your final full size, you know, here's where you go. Hmm. And it, you know, would be a place not Pages. Interesting. And uh, the yeah, the owner of Pages is an incredibly smart guy. You know him real mm -hmm. well. And he said, I don't want to lose that business. And so we need to create at least the opportunity to be on that list of places that, that the teacher wants to send their student for their final instrument. And so, you know, we started building this separate division, which is the way we went about it, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be that way. It's a matter of, of having the level of instrument and the level of expertise to have the credibility to command the respect of the people in the community. And that doesn't happen overnight. It certainly didn't happen overnight for us, but it was just a matter of changing, you know, changing perception, changing one mind at a time and, and doing that over time. You know, it sounds like you talk about this list of, of places that teachers recommend. It sounds like the string shop is automatically on that list and a school music store has to work to get onto that list. Does that sound right? It sounds right. Yeah, for sure. And depending on your area and the number of shops that exist, that can be, that can be a challenging obstacle to overcome. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you find music stores, school music stores actually do better than string shops that maybe ed reps can kind of position their school music store with the string shops in their local market? Is there something that you actually might do better. Oh, I think there are several things that you can do better. Um, there are things that you can do with a larger organization that are just impossible, you know, for a smaller organization. And, you know, one of them is selection. For instance, you know, none of the local violin shops in my area are going to have any meaningful number of bases at any one time. Hmm. They don't, they literally don't have the physical real estate to have, you know, more than one or two upright bases. Interesting. Whereas for us, we have the the square footage and the resources to have, you know, 20, you know, upper level step up bases. And so we're able to court that market, that component of our school music area in a way that the the traditional violin shop would struggle to. Yeah. And that's just one, that's one, you know, one aspect of that. And then that selection extends to all the instruments, you know, whereas you might walk into a traditional violin shop looking for a cello between three and five thousand dollars and they say that's the one that i have you know and point to one instrument whereas you know we have the opportunity to say okay all seven of these instruments fall in that category or whatever the number mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. but that the teacher you know enjoys having that opportunity and again because we have the selection and the larger number of instruments we can offer a more generous trial period as well okay you know, a lot of small violin shops are 
for multiple reasons are offering, you know, maybe three day or maximum seven day trials where, you know, on an important purchase, we're able to offer them weeks, ah. you know, to, to make that selection. Okay. Which again, the argument can be made good and bad, but you know, we've found that in our community that there are teachers that really appreciate that because of their schedules and the fact that we can send out, you know, three, four instruments if we need to, for that teacher to take to a studio mm -hmm. and, and partner with them like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking one aspect that we, we shouldn't forget about is the audience we're talking to right now. Most violin shops that I'm aware of versus school music stores. Now, most violin shops don't have school reps, whereas school music stores so focused on schools do have school reps. And I think that could be such a powerful differentiator between the two different kinds of stores, as long as that ed rep is, is you know, a, a great one. 100%. Absolutely, Shane. And then the other thing that we can do because we have those school reps, because we have those relationships, now we can with, you know, our staff, we can go to the schools. Whereas, you know, a small traditional violin shop might be, you know, two employees right. or three employees where they don't, they can't take the time to go on a Wednesday night and do a step up event at a school for two or three hours. Whereas we have the staffing and the experience and the inventory to take the shop to the school in a way that is unique to, to our abilities. Yeah, yeah. One area that I find ed reps struggle with is actually at the, the beginning instrument level, competing with string shops at that beginner level. I think sometimes teachers have this, this picture in their mind of the string shop whittling every single rental instrument out of scratch. And that's what they're offering is rentals. Do you have any thoughts on, on how to compete at that beginner level? between a school music store and, and a string shop? Yeah, I, I, it's a really good point. And again, I think that part of it, we talked about it earlier, is that because we have students starting at age four, or let's not even go that extreme, let's say, you know, age eight, you know, at least in our community, some of those students are going, you know, to the local Suzuki Academy, or they're, they're participating in in music that's more private teacher focused than, than orchestra director focused. And those private teachers are the ones that are most likely to have the relationship with the traditional violin shop. Yeah. And also a lot of band and orchestra stores, you know, they don't want to stock the, you know, really small fractional size instruments as deeply as they might, or they don't pay as much attention to them in terms of the quality of the instruments offered at that level. Mm. You know, it's really difficult to have a really well set up eighth size violin, <laughs> you know, available there, the, the tolerances on those tiny instruments are so small. So forming the relationships with the teaching outlets that are teaching those younger students on those beginning instruments is essential as well. Because if, if you've missed that whole, you know, customer base, then when they enter that school music environment, they already ha are established with that local violin shop instead mm. of you. Yeah. So making sure that you're kind of going to where the, where the players are is important. Yeah. Good. Do you find the, the quality of a, a beginner instrument from a string shop versus a school music store that, that does well, like a pages, do you find there's much difference? Not much. Now, yeah, I have had situations in which, you know, the small string shop that only has, you know, three quarter size cellos in their rental fleet you know, and that they are sitting there spending hours and hours, you know, tweaking hmm. that setup to perfection. Yes, occasionally that might be a better instrument, but that's also not going to be a viable source of instruments for a school corporation that's going to have, you know, a bunch of beginning mm, players. Yeah. So no, on any given day, you know, the, the private teachers and orchestra directors in our area have nothing but extremely positive things to say about our beginning instruments. Hmm. And and the directors, to be perfectly honest, are the ones that are elevating, helping elevate us to that point mm. because they are demanding certain things. And to, to be of service to them, we have to provide that level of quality. So I definitely think it can be a very mutually beneficial relationship where the, the directors and teachers are driving the quality up, you know, by through their requirements. And mm. then we have to to meet those and it makes everybody better. Yeah. Yeah. So it's possible that it's a perception thing with string shops, not necessarily reality. 
when it comes to the beginning instruments. What can what can an ed rep do to kind of change that perception? It's definitely an uphill battle. I mean, again, because if if the if the string teacher really wants to see that eighth size violin displayed on top of a grand piano sitting on a Persian rug, <laughs> sitting on a hardwood floor, like, you know, the typical store is not going to be able to offer that. But I think in terms of just doing less, you know, talking about the other guy and just more talking about what you do well, hmm. you know, just continuing to sell the positive aspects of of having that relationship with you and just flat out reminding them. It is amazing after 16 years, you know, of, of, of working at Encore and working to build this at Pages, you know, I'll still have someone say, oh, I just didn't know that you did that hmm. or I didn't know you had that. And there's part of me that wants to beat my head against the wall when that happens. And there's another part of me that's saying, thank you. You know, it's, it's keeping me honest that there's still work to be done and there's still, you know, information and and needing to get the message to the the people who need to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that's come up in, in some recent episodes here is bringing out samples of, of things like strings and, and instruments. Would, would What would you recommend bringing out to an orchestra teacher to show them in the classroom from the store to kind of change that perception? Again, recognizing that that time is so precious to them, it, definitely focus on what's most important. You know, they don't, they don't need to see what your latest, you know, mute is, mm. you know, bring the instruments that they would see in their classroom. So you want, you want to say this, if your students rent a full size violin from us, this is what they're going to see. And, uh, you know, before you take that instrument out to the school, definitely run it through your shop, yeah. you know, make sure, make sure that it's something that you want them to see in every conceivable aspect. If you're going to use it like again, as the business card, but they, they want a great sounding orchestra and to do so they have to be able to teach and to be able to teach, they need time and, you know, to, to gain time, they can't be fiddling around with, with non-working subpar instruments. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Do you ever see orchestra teachers come into the store? Yes. And we encourage it. Mm. There's, you know, I have, standing offer for, you know, coffee or, you know, lunch or whatever it takes to, to have them come in and see, because if they can come in the store and they can see what we offer and they can see the instruments and our, our service technicians and our luthiers, that is such a powerful, powerful tool to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. So for the stores out there that are fortunate enough to have a John Rahani like yourself, how do you engage with the ed reps and the school teachers? How does this all kind of work together between the in the store and out in the schools? Yeah, we, we, try to, we try to tackle that on several different levels. If I'm doing something in terms of a step-up display at a school, or if I'm doing something where I'm going out to a classroom it's you know only courteous and good for me to be communicating that with the associated ed rep with that program. Mm. You know, we definitely want the right hand to know what the left hand is doing at all times. But again, our ed reps, you know, they've got their their noses down. They are going, they're focused on what they're doing. And so we have to communicate because it's it's too easy for that that gap between what's happening outside of the store and what's happening inside of the store just to not ever feel connected. Mm, yeah. um, so that's a constant, I don't want to say battle, but I mean, that there is real effort that goes on to make sure that we're doing things in harmony and in concert with each other that are building upon each other and not contradicting each yeah. other. Yeah, so coordinating that effort. And really, you know, my role to complement the ed reps is to be that next level of information. So they have the basic knowledge that we've been talking about. But when that, you know, when that orchestra director asks that very specific question, either about a very specific product or, you know, a very specific question about an instrument, that then I'm that resource. Mm. I'm I'm the expert at the store that can that can answer that. Yeah. And then they have one kind of relationship with those directors. They're handling a lot of the nuts and bolts. And then I get to be more just, I don't know, you know, the friend um, hmm. here at the store. So they don't need to call me just when they need to order an A string for an instrument. Yeah. They, they're working with the ed rep. But when they want to talk about an upcoming concert and, you know, or an event or something, then that's when I'm, I'm drawn in. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm curious about your role at the store. Was there a string specialist there before you that was working in this same capacity? No, that position was was created. I mean, that's what I was hired for here at Pages. Okay. Tom May is one of our repair technicians, and he's been here for 30 plus years, I think now. And so he was prior to me, a lot of times he would p- put on both hats. Mm. You know, if a, if a teacher or director came in with a string specific question and he's great with people and very warm. And so, you know, he would play that role. But since I've been here, that shifted where, you know, he's in the workshop and then I'm handling everything on the, on the sales floor. Yeah. So for those stores out there that are listening right now that don't have a string specialist, how did, how did your role creation start to change the string business for pages? I'm probably not the right person to ask yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's been fantastic. Yeah, of course. It's no, been amazing. But, yeah, 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 it's been amazing. <laughs> Best decision of their lives. Yeah, but I think Mark was very forward thinking uh, in the creation of this and other roles within the company, understanding at the core that his target customer wanted to speak with an expert. Mm. They wanted the right environment to to be in. They didn't want, you know, their violin hanging right next to a trumpet on the sales floor on Slatwall. Right. You know, they 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 wanted a different experience. And so by creating that different experience and then by, you know, hiring someone who had the connections in the community and the background to form the important relationships, it just created an environment and an opportunity for us to to move forward in in capturing that market share that we were after. Mm. So it sounds like having your role really transformed the string business there. 100%. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody's listening if you're if you're on the fence of whether you should hire a string specialist or not, there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> and and Mark if you're listening to this, you know, good good job. Good job, Hein. <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's excellent. So any other last words of advice for ed reps who, who might be struggling with the string world and want to increase their business there? Yeah, I remember a conversation I had growing up with a, a violin maker in my area in North Carolina. And he, I've, I played several of his cellos over the years and we developed a close friendship. And when I started this job at Pages, it was one of the first opportunities I had to go to the, the Violin Society of America, the, the competition. Hmm. Where, where, you know, all these modern violin makers come together and they, they show their instruments and it's a competition. But I had grown up revering, you know, all of these famous violin makers. And I asked my friend, I said, you know, how do I talk to them? You know, hmm. I'm going to be at this conference and, oh, I've been reading about these people all my life. And I'm so, you know, kind of awed about the idea of, of being in the same room with them. And he, in a real, you know, his, his great Southern accent, he's like, John, they're more scared of you than you are of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I do feel like that's often the, the, the attitude that we should have about working with, you know, these orchestra directors and these private teachers is that, you know, we should feel comfortable engaging them because they want to be engaged. They want the community. They want the connection. Mm. They want to feel important and valued. And so we just have to take that step towards them and the hardest thing to do. But once you've done it, then some of the most beautiful and and strong and, and durable relationships that you'll ever have, both personally and professionally, come out of that. Yeah, that is so true. I, I just thinking back to when I was an ed rep, some of my favorite people to work with were the orchestra teachers. And it, it just took talking to them. I, I was a little scared at first being a trumpet player. I had no string background, but they are just awesome people. And I love talking to them. And the business grew. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's incredible. It's incredible. And especially, I mean, over time, you know, if you continue to honor that relationship and you continue to make promises and keep promises that it can just build into something truly beautiful, not just at a personal level, but also a relationship that has a very positive impact on the business. Mm-hmm. A profitable side of the business, right? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. John, I can't thank you enough for your your time and your words of wisdom. I know this was a very helpful episode for, for those listening out there on the road. Such a pleasure, Shane, anytime. We hope you found the information in this episode useful and something you can use in your everyday life as an ed rep. 
If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about and have presented on a future episode of EdRep Radio, or you'd like to give us some feedback in general, please email us at edrepradio at eastmanstrings.com. To learn more about Eastman Music Company, go to our website, eastmanmusiccompany.com, or give your Eastman rep a call. Thanks, and drive safe.